Between selective censorship and the rise in propaganda, it's becoming increasingly obvious that Big Brother would love nothing more than to shelter society from the truth. But on top of that, society has also become so comfortable putting all of their trust in paid for celebrities, over promising politicians, and let's not forget the totally not biased media. But it's 2021, and if you have two working eyes and a sensible headspace, there is no denying that things are clearly not okay. Taking headlines as truth and counting every opinion as fact simply does not cut it anymore. So unless we intend on helping the powers that be destroy whatever's left of our social fabric, it's time to get serious and research like your life depends on it. Hi, my name is Gothix and today I'm teaching you how to research effectively while avoiding propaganda. The first piece of advice that I'll give is probably the most important one, and that is to avoid talking about something unless you actually know what you're talking about. So basically, know your shit. It's okay to be uninformed on a topic, but it's not okay to confidently speak on that topic without fully understanding it. Doing so plays a direct role in spreading misinformation, thus leaving the rest of us to sift through the bullshit. So whenever someone asks me for my opinion on something and I don't know the answer, I'll tell them straight up, I have no idea what you're talking about or I'll need more information before I can comment. You'll get way more respect by being honest rather than pretending to be knowledgeable when you're not. So this means reading the full article instead of just the headline, clicking on and actually reading the provided sources, being able to differentiate between facts and opinions or truth between satire, and truly informing yourselves on the details. So for example, when I ask BLM protesters how many unarmed black people were killed by police in 2019 compared to white people, they'll usually respond with some crazy astronomical number or tell me I don't know. Excuse me? If you're joining a movement against racial injustice, then at minimum, you should know what these numbers are in order to determine if BLM's narrative is true. Because otherwise, what's stopping them from using willfully ignorant people in order to push an ulterior motive? Next up, ditch your existing search engine and swap it with DuckDuckGo. The reason for this is unlike Google, for example, DuckDuckGo doesn't track or store your information, but more importantly, it provides unbiased and unfiltered search results. If you were to search the same phrase on Google as you would on DuckDuckGo, you might be surprised as to how much the results vary. On Google, you'll get results tailored to what they think you're likely to click on based on the data profile that they've built on you over time from tracking your activity. This is extremely dangerous because in order to show you results that you're more likely to click on, they need to filter out the results that they think you'll skip, which could include the truth. So for example, let's say that you have a specific political leaning. Using Google means that you're more likely to get results that you already agree with and less likely to ever see opposing viewpoints. This will ultimately create more echo chambers that are already contributing to our very polarized society. So now that we've got you on the right search engine, we need to expand your resources beyond the confines of your echo chamber because while it may be comfortable to surround yourself with opinions that you already hold, much can be learned from those you disagree with. This means that if you already follow the news on outlets that you already agree with, it's time to balance it out with sources that you disagree with. Or, more specifically, if you subscribe to sources that lead in one political direction, you should also subscribe to those that are in the reverse. This will help you get comfortable hearing opinions that differ from yours so that you don't freak out at the thought of a disagreement, but also train your brain to pick up on the media's attempts to deceive you by comparing and contrasting the information provided. The next tip I have for you is to be open-minded, or more specifically, be objective. I can count on my hands and feet how many times times I've been called a conspiracy theorist, only to have the same folks email me months later to say, you were right. This is why I get really annoyed when people discredit valid information because they hold some type of bias towards the person delivering that information. I saw this a lot in my comment section after I uploaded a video in defense of Candace Owens. I presented factual data that supported the degeneracy of black American culture, but in the comments, many people refused to accept the data I presented because of something hurtful Candace might have said in the past. So in other words, they discredited factual evidence because of their obsession with the individual. 
Another reason that I want you to get comfortable with thinking more objectively is because narratives can easily be manipulated and distorted while behavior itself, when examined with as much objectivity as possible, cannot. So for example, if politicians are advising civilians that they're required to wear a mask in order to stop the spread of COVID, but then you catch them outside in public in a crowd without wearing one themselves, that should raise some questions. <laughs> the final tip that I have for you is to think critically by paying attention, asking questions, and challenging narratives. Whether it's a failed relationship or a failed business venture, I'm sure most people can think back to a time where they were deceived by someone they trusted. And as painful as those experiences may be, it's a stark reminder that we should always approach the unknown with skepticism and avoid putting all of our trust in the hands of other people, especially those who haven't had a substantial impact on our lives. So when we get our information from journalists, politicians, or even celebrities, we need to get into the habit of asking ourselves, what would this person gain by telling me this? So for example, there was recent footage from an undercover journalist at Project Veritas where they got the technical director of CNN on camera saying the quiet things out loud. I'm going to use that footage as a case study for this portion of the video so I can show you in real time how to think critically. Let's roll the clip. Sad news doesn't do well with ratings, you know, like, if you can get someone in passion, that does really well with ratings. Sad news, back to back to back, doesn't do really well unless it affects them directly. COVID, gangbusters with ratings, right? Which is why we constantly have a death toll on the side, which I have a major problem with that we're tallying how many people die every day, because I've even look at it and be like look at it and be like let's make it higher like why isn't it high enough you know today like it would make our point better if it was higher and i'm like what am i rallying for that's a problem yeah that we're doing that you know why, why don't you guys at cnn show the recovery rates on the death tolls at least recovery rates oh um who's had it and then recovered. recovered um because that's not scary that's yeah that, i i would imagine that's why they don't do it yeah, yeah. that's what i think if it bleeds it leads yeah if it bleeds it leads yeah. i like that uh -huh. So CNN hyped up the Covivi death toll while neglecting to report the recovery rates because, as Charlie said, fear sells. So when someone tells a quadruple masker that Covivi has a high survival rate, it's not to denounce the existence of the virus, but rather give them a peace of mind because clearly the media has no problem sacrificing the public's mental well-being by fear-mongering in exchange for higher ratings. So assuming I never saw this video, the first thing I would ask myself Myself is, is the panic over COVID disproportionate to the severity over COVID? This also ties back to what I said at the beginning of this video with informing yourself on key details because these details could mean the difference between awareness and complete pandemonium. Because let me tell you, coming from someone that was a headline reader at the start of COVID, I know firsthand what it's like to panic, and I have all of these unused oxygen cans to prove it. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> I was trying to do some research on like the Asian heat, like the, you know, the, the people are getting attacked or a bunch of black men that have been attacking Asian. Um, so I'm like, what are you doing? Like, we're trying to like help like with the BLM. I haven't seen anything about focusing on the color of people's skin that aren't white. It just they just aren't saying anything you know what i mean they're just not all of a sudden that story loses a little steam and they just like leave it be i don't know i think i, I it's got to be trends like what people will latch on to Next up, he admitted that they're trying to help Black Lives Matter, so clearly CNN has a bias. A follow-up question to his statement would be, why? But when you're asking yourself that, be open to the possibilities other than they want to fight racial injustice, because as I lead into my next point, you'll see why settling for that answer is not sufficient with this case study. 
He goes on to say that the news coverage surrounding suspected hate crimes are reported differently depending on what color the suspect looks like. Not only is this unethical, I attribute this to journalistic malpractice because they're creating more racial division with the promises of higher ratings. Additionally, this supports my theory that all this rhetoric regarding the rise in white supremacy isn't as big of an issue, if an issue at all. Because if we're really seeing the rise of white supremacy in America, you wouldn't have to manufacture it. And what do you know? I already made a video with crime data arguing against this exact narrative long before this undercover footage was released. My point being, this proves in real time the importance of challenging narratives with objective research. Okay, let's move on. Listen to the way they ask questions. Because they're not actually asking questions. Who? Any reporter oh, okay. on CNN. Okay. What they're actually doing is they're telling the person what to say. It's an art form. What's that? There's an art form to it. We've led them to talk about how we want them to talk about it. It's always like leading them in a direction before they even open their mouth. And the only people that we will let on the air for the most part, are people that have a proven track record of taking the bait. He then goes on to say that all of CNN's guests have a proven track record of taking the bait in terms of leading their guests towards the appropriate answer, or in my opinion, bait them into saying something that can be later clipped out of context, like Trump's infamous, there were fine people on both sides that he was demonized for. Here's the clip that CNN originally reported regarding that line. Take a look. I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides. You had some very bad people in that group, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. The president of the United States of America there saying that the press has treated unfairly those people who marched alongside neo-Nazis and white nationalists in the Klan. And here is the original unedited clip. It was a horrible thing to watch, but there is another side. There was a group on this side, you can call them the left, you've just called them the left, that came violently attacking the other group. So you can say what you want, but that's the way it is. <laughs> So you said there was hatred, there was violence on both sides. Uh, are well, I do think there's blame. The yes, I think there's blame on both sides. You look at you look at both sides. I think there's blame on both sides, and I have no doubt about it. And you don't have any doubt about it either. And, only and, the Nazis. And, and if you reported it accurately, you would say. And you had people, and I'm not talking about the neo Nazis and the white nationalists, because they should be condemned totally. But you had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists, okay? And the press has treated them absolutely unfairly. Now, in the other group also, you had some fine people, but you also had troublemakers, and you see them come with the, with the black outfits and with the helmets and with the baseball bats. You got a, you had a lot of bad you had a lot of bad people in the other group too. Well, the press has treated unfairly, sir. I'm sorry. I just didn't understand what you were saying. You were saying the press has treated white nationalists unfairly. No. I just didn't understand what you were saying. No. There were people in that rally, and I looked the night before. If you look, there were people protesting very quietly the taking down of the statue of Robert E. Lee. I'm sure in that group there were some bad ones. The following day, it looked like they had some rough, bad people neo-Nazis, uh, white nationalists, whatever you want to call them. But you had a lot of people in that group that were there to innocently protest and very legally protest because, you know, I don't know if you know, they had a permit. The other group didn't have a permit. So I only tell you this, there are two sides to a story. If a major news outlet was able to do this to a sitting president, how can you be sure that they won't do the same to everyday people? Kind of makes you wonder if your hatred for Orange Man was truly legitimate or manufactured by the media. Last but not least, let's take a look at this final clip. I mean, there's no such thing as um, unbiased news. But there's too many agendas. There's too many people that have jobs that need to feed their families for it to be unbiased. Yeah. It's impossible. The, the, the most unbiased news is grassroots out of people's basements with podcasts. That's the most unbiased you probably get. 
So Charlie said the most unbiased news is from people's basements with podcasts, and I'd also agree with that statement. But hearing that, I think back to the CNN segment where it was suggested that YouTube should turn down the capabilities of conservative influencers. We have to turn down the capability of these conservative influencers to reach these huge audiences. There are, are people on YouTube, for example, that have a larger, daytime, a larger audience than daytime CNN, and they are extremely radical and pushing extremely uh, radical views. And so it's up to the Facebooks and YouTubes in particular to think about whether or not they want to be effectively cable networks for disinformation. So, Alex, are conservative influencers truly the cause of misinformation? Or is it possible that there was some truth to what Charlie said, and you're simply trying to redirect the public's attention back to potential propaganda? I guess if this video gets taken down, then we'll know the answer to that, because after all, it's just a question. This sums up my tips on how to effectively research, and I hope it helps you on your journey towards finding the truth. There were a lot more tips that I could have thrown in, but I think I'll save it for a different video. Maybe next time I'll show you how to challenge others directly so you can easily spot the difference between the informed and a manipulator. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and don't forget to hit that subscribe button for more content like this. Also, be sure to sign up for my mailing list so we can stay connected. My name is Gothics, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!